I want to bring on our first guest, who's a, a very special ingredient of the Joe Franklin Show. And it's, it's my pleasure, my honor, my thrill, coming from the man himself, to announce Bob Diamond, director of the yeah. Joe Franklin Show. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> What's up, Bob? I'm just so excited to be here. For you to ask for me to come in here to talk about the man I loved for 35 years on that show, and every show was just a ball to do. Listen, it's my pleasure having you here, and I'm glad you took the time out to come over to Staten Island. I would have come for any reason. So now why don't you go back and tell us, tell us your story. <laughs> Tell us your story, how you got... Well, I actually, I actually started as his stage manager, and uh, I came in in 1964. Uh, and at the time, anybody who remembers WOR and the Mets, WOR was the Met baseball yes. station. And in the summer, the director at that time of the Joe Franklin show also directed Mets baseball, and it, baseball was his love. And so during the summer, there had to be a summer replacement. Well, I was Joe's stage manager, one of two. And I found out one day that I was going to be directing the show. And I thought, terrific, I loved it. And make a long story short, uh, at the end of the season, I expected to go back to being a stage manager and walked in one day to see the schedule for the next week and found out I'm directing the show. Let's say 10 years later, I found out that it's because Joe walked into the manager's office, station manager's office, and said, he's my director. That's who's going to direct my show. 10 years later? 10 years later. That's when I found out how I'd gotten the show. Uh, because he, he wanted to know why this other director wouldn't put his name at the end of the show. <laughs> and Joe looked at the uh, PA one day and said, how come Bob puts his name at the show and he, this other one doesn't? He said, because he doesn't like doing the show. Yeah, that's, that's bull -less. I don't understand anybody who wouldn't love doing that show. It was a standard thing with me from, I'm going to say, the first show. The minute we dissolved out of the opening credits to Joe, I would say, cue my star. And damn it, I met it. That's great. And I did it for 35 years. And that's awesome. Did you get a good pension plan out of it or what? <laughs> From Joe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, you. the station, I was employed by the station. I know. And you had to be a member of the Directors Guild, and that was my good pension. I'm just busting your my, chest. My ball was was that I got to do Joe Franklin's show. Uh, I would have done it for nothing. Yeah. No, I uh, hear you. Yeah. No. He, 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 it was terrific. But, I mean, we just developed a relationship. Now, you got to remember, his was the last show to go on to videotape. Uh, we were live. And when we started out, we were at 9 o'clock in the morning. 8 o'clock in the morning was Romper Room in the same studio. Wow. And Romper Room was in this corner. We were in that. And they had two minutes to swing the cameras around for Joe to get in there and do a show. And the show was ad lib. Joe never knew exactly who was going to be on the show. At times, he would ask people, and then he'd, somebody else would come in, and we'd have that. And I would find out many times, just before we went on the air, who was on the show. Uh, and it was always a ball. That's tough for the host. It was okay, except when they said, well, it's a live act. And then I'd have to look at the, my audio man, and, and they'd say, we got two minutes to set up an audio show. For, for somebody who's coming in to sing. And it could have been Johnny James, it could have been, I mean, it didn't matter to Joe who it was. He, he just figured we could do it, and we did it. Was it hard doing a live show without no cuts and no uh, rollbacks? Not with Joe, not with Joe. Uh, it was never difficult. I mean, there were times, uh, his studios, when we first started, were on 42nd Street on the east side of uh, Broadway. And there were days where we would go out of opening credits, 
into a, a film clip because mm -hmm. Joe hadn't gotten there yet. Uh, because he'd gotten on the phone with somebody, uh, there had been a delay getting down the elevator from his building to get across the street, but we would just, you know, roll with whatever the show was. Now, did you guys have like, uh, pep, you know, like, uh, what's it called, production meetings before the show? No. Did you ever meet or no. talk on the phone and say, Bob, I need we, this? We, we, we talked, we talked all the time, but we didn't have production meetings. We didn't sit and say, now we'll do this and we'll do that. No, no, that wasn't Joe because Joe didn't know what he wanted to do, and it, it depended on who the guest was. Yeah, I got you. Uh, that's how we did the show. Now, another guest that was supposed to be here tonight, uh, Rich Ornstein. Yeah. Why don't you talk a little bit about that, because I got a clip we're gonna show in a couple of minutes with him and Joe. Rich, Richie came in as the producer, and uh, it was sort of fun, because he would sit and sort of coach Joe. And our biggest problem with, was when Richie, uh, we discovered that we were going to move from Manhattan to Secaucus, New Jersey. Joe didn't like to travel anywhere yeah. uh, except Manhattan. Uh, side story, he would do the Johnny Carson show in LA, but he'd never <laughs> see the show because he'd be on the plane to get back to New York. Oh, really? And he would say, was it a good show? Did you see it? And we'd have to tell I never him. knew he was on Johnny Carson. Oh, he, Johnny love loved that. him. He, Johnny would bring him on the show, and he would sh bring him his old film clips with him, and, and he, they would talk about film clips. That's great. Oh, yeah, John, Johnny loved him. But R Richie had to take care of Joe, nurse him into, okay, we're going to go out and do the taping in Secaucus, wherever that was, as far as Joe was concerned. Uh, once he got there with his with his guests, everything was fine, but it was that fear. And now, when we started taping, we taped on Saturdays, and we taped, in one day, we taped four shows. Wow. The Friday show was always a repeat. And Joe, we would start taping at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we would finish at six o'clock at night. Our shows a half hour? Our shows. Uh, that's, that's great. Our shows with very little break between, half hour between each show. That's tough. We didn't have an audience. Um, and then Joe would go and do an all night radio show. And it was Richie's job to make sure that he was at the studio in time and then got back to WOR radio in time. That's great. No, Rich, Richie was, and he, he, he helped produce a lot of things and got people in. Uh, he would bring people to Joe and introduce them. He, Rich, Rich, Rich was a great, great person. He's having a little with. back problems. He had to go to his chiropractor, I and mean, he wasn't feeling too good. So he, he's going to come on the show in the future. But I have a clip of him and Joe, something, the only thing I could find. So we're going to roll it. Okay, great. Control room, let's roll that clip of uh, Rich and Joe. Okay, now in a movie mood, one of our favorite moments, we play trivia. We try and stump the uh -oh. panel. Uh-oh. Right. What do we win? What's, what's the grand prize? One, Golden popcorn. One, <laughs> oh, one, so goal, <laughs> one gold plated matzo ball. No, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Richard Ornstein is our resident triviologist, and he's going to try and stump us. I don't want to see him. Lucille Ball, portrayed on film, a role created on Broadway by Ethel Merman, identified the film. This is a tough one. I can only think of Lucy Ball, who did the part that was created on Broadway by uh, Angela Lansbury in a, in, a, in a play called, in a movie called uh, Mame, right? But I don't know which one that could be. This one was created by Ethel Merman. Dewberry was a lady. Right, I remember that. Oh, who that. played the title role in the Peter Brooks production of King Lear? <laughs> no idea. Lawrence Olivier. Paul Schofield. Right. Mm. Uh, Here was a tough one. Here's a real <laughs> tough one. The song Mona Lisa that was made famous by Nat King Cole and was in the 19, was in, featured in what 1950s film? Could it be Captain Carey, something like that? That's right, Captain Carey, USA. Right, right. That was with Alan Ladd and right. Wanda Hendricks. Uh, who sang the song, A Pretty Girl is Like a Melody, in the 1936 it was, film? It was, it, was, it was in the great Ziegfeld. It was, it was Dennis Morgan's right. lips, but it was Alan Jones. Very good. Who sang yeah. A Pretty Girl is Like a Melody. Let's watch some pretty announcements right now because the time is fleeting away. All right. Okay. I remember that show. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and, and that Rich, Richie did that a lot, uh, coming on and and trying to stump Joe, and usually could, which was surprising, because uh, I think he just really pulled some stuff that Joe was not there for. Because you could never stump Joe. I mean, I don't know it's except amazing, for Richie who 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 could stump him.
It's amazing. Now, tell me one of your fondest memories of Joe. <laughs> oh, God, one of my fondest memories. Oh, I think my favorite thing was once uh, jo Joe's uh, wife had gotten quite ill from uh, MS, and they were first-nighters. Uh, they had uh, opening night to every show. And uh, the first time his wife Lois said to me, Bob, you're now going to go with Joe. And I go, great, that's terrific. I love to go with him. And we walked into the play, and the lights went down, and Joe went. <laughs> <laughs> the applause started, and Joe said, did we like that act? <laughs> and I'd say, yes or no. And he'd go, okay, lights would go down. <laughs> That was Joe. He loved going, but the minute the lights went down, he was, and any applause, he, he, he'd perk up and then he'd give, go back to sleep. And he did this all the time, except for one play uh, that I was with him at. The opening night of Les Mis, 7,000 years ago now. Uh -huh. uh, we were taping uh, the show. We finished taping at 5.30. Opening night was a 6.30 curtain because it's a long show. We had forgotten that. Once we realized it, we are in Secaucus, New Jersey. We have to fly into New York. I mean, just the Richie Ornstein's car got us in there right away. They had actually held the curtain for us. Wow. Uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, Jerry Schoenfeld, it was a, a Schubert production, Jerry Schoenfeld. Uh, held the curtain and we sat down. I am in a pair of jeans. Joe is in his not opening night outfit. And next to me is the composer of the opera, uh, of the musical. And I go, oh, great. That night, Joe never went to sleep. That's great. Did he know who was next to him or no? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, <laughs> that didn't bother him. I I was the one that was embarrassed, but Joe. But that was the only time I know that Joe didn't do his traditional thing. And you can ask any actor that's known him, that they oh he was on he was on stage. He came to see the show, but he sleeps. That's great. That was my Joe. Well, Bob, thanks a lot for coming on the show. That's your time. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, Facebook, just Bob Diamond. I'm there. Beautiful. You're a great guy. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, John. My pleasure. It's a pleasure.